All right. So I'm Kelly Eversole, the Executive Director of the International Alliance for Phytobiomes Research, and we're joined today by Will Hay from USDA ARS, who will be giving us a webinar about uh, ensuring food safety and security, evaluating and utilizing plant pest pathogen phytochemical interactions. But before we move to that, I'd like to give you a little overview of the Phytobiomes Alliance. We are a nonprofit consortium of industry, academic, and governmental scientists, and we are sponsored by a number of uh, large and small companies, research institutes, uh, governmental uh, research institutes as well. And uh, <clears throat> we are able to do this webinar series because of our sponsors. So I'd like to, <clears throat> excuse me, thank all of our sponsors for being with being supportive of our efforts and working with us. <clears throat> so a lot, there's been a lot of confusion about what a phytobiome is. And in essence, it's a complex system of plant-based agriculture with the concept that a biome is a site-specific environment and that plants are in that biome and that part of the all the different components that come together includes the microbiomes, the macroorganisms, macrofauna, other animals and plants, the weather and climate, as well as the soils. And all of that is influenced, heavily influenced by management practices. <clears throat> Our vision is that by 2050, that all farmers will have the ability to use predictive and prescriptive analytics based on geophysical and biological conditions for determining the best combination of crops, management practices, and inputs for a specific field in a given year, really looking towards a, a true digital agriculture that can work towards finding the most sustainable solution for any particular farming operation at any particular farm. So our next webinar not, uh, will be held in a couple of weeks. I've got some problems with my, there we go, that's a little better, <clears throat> with uh, a great webinar about the journey from discovery to product uh, from Bayer Crop Science. And you can register by going to our website and our uh, lookup phytobiomesalliance.org and then webinars, or you can actually register to get on the mailing list to find out about all of our events. But just before we get started, I'd just like to let you know that the webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the Phytobiomes Alliance YouTube channel in a, in a few days. And as you look through the, the chat box, the, there's a presentation section will be followed by a Q&A and you can in, submit your questions in the Q&A panel. And just a reminder, please do not use the chat uh, for questions because we won't see them. So if you have questions that you'd like to ask Will, please put those in the Q&A panel. And then uh, also if you'd like to talk with other attendees or any of the organizers, you can use the chat. You are able already to download our presentations in the handout panel already. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Will, um, who will give us a great presentation on phytochemical interactions. So Will, thank you very much for being with us today. Hello, can everyone hear me? Hello, um, can everyone hear me and see the slides? Yes. Okay. Um, hello, my name is uh, Dr. William Hay. I work for the USDA. I'm a research plant physiologist, and today I will be talking to you about ensuring food safety and security and evaluating utilizing plant pest pathogen and phytochemical interactions. And so just a brief presentation overview. I'm going to give an um, introduction about myself, um, the USDA and the unit I work for some background information on the two papers that I was asked to um, come talk to you about today. The first is the biopesticide synergy when combining plant flavonoids and entomopathogenic baclovirus. And then the second is 
the effect of elevated CO2 and how it alters wheat nutritional content um, and how that impacts serum gymnasium growth and mycotoxin production on grain. And finally, some uh, brief closing remarks and acknowledgments. So um, a brief introduction about myself. Uh, very few of you who are watching, maybe none of you actually know who I am. So uh, I'm a research plant physiologist with the U.S. Department of Agriculture and the Agricultural Research Service. And I am part of the Mycotoxin Prevention and Applied Microbiology Unit at the National Center for Agricultural Utilization Research. To put that all together, I work for the USDA ARS in the NCAUR facility in the MPM unit. So I work for the government and we love acronyms, so it's a long name. But um, my research focus is on the impact of climate change on cereal crop nutritional quality, plant susceptibility to mycotoxigenic fungal pathogens. And I just want to give a brief introduction to kind of what my research unit works on. And so I'm part of the Mycotoxin Prevention and Applied Microbiology Unit, and I am one of 36 scientists, technicians, and support staff who works to improve food safety, to develop technologies to detect and uh, mycotoxins and ensure food safety, to enhance crop protection by looking at preventing crop diseases, looking for resistant cultivars, as well as how to eliminate or reduce mycotoxin contamination in uh, the food supply. Um, I particularly work to ensure global food security, and um, I'm involved in research to promote climate resilient agriculture, and finally, um, for biotechnology and innovation, looking at identifying microbial resources for biocontrol agents or determining how uh, pathogen populations might shift over time or mining into the genome of specific fungal pathogens to determine why exactly or how exactly we might be able to control them in the future. And this research unit is comprised of geneticists, biochemists, chemists, um, physiologists like myself, mycologists, and a wide variety of scientific disciplines. And we all work together to try to synergize our work and to make an impact to improve uh, food safety and security. And with that regard, we are only one unit out of seven at this research facility with 175 uh, scientists re and research staff. And so the USDA promotes a wide variety of scientific disciplines to work together to tackle uh, difficult projects. And so the first um, manuscript I'd like to talk to you about, we recently published in uh, Nature Scientific Reports, and it's on biopesticide synergy when combining plant flavonoids and entomopathogenic baclovirus. And uh, for this research project, I worked with four different units within our building. Um, I was a plant physiologist, and I worked with a plant biochemist, an entomologist, and it might be I'm curious, but we also worked with a polymer chemist, and I'll explain that in a little bit. And so I want to give you a brief background on the three players in this system that we'll talk about. And so first I want to talk about plant secondary compounds, flavonoids. Um, they're polyphenolic secondary metabolites. The flavonoid compounds are involved in numerous biochemical processes, including uh, plant defense, particularly against insect pests. They're produced in response to biotic stress. They can also inhibit pathogen growth. They're involved in protecting plant tissues from insect herbivory. And while they can often be described as having a broad defense effect, they can actually have very highly specific flavonoid insect interactions and uh, can be quite complex. But they shouldn't just be considered to be plant defense compounds, but they're also involved in soybean nodule formation, and they're also known to be potent antioxidants, um, phytoestrogens, as well as uh, rather you know, powerful UV absorbers. So the second part of this is the insect pest in the cabbage looper, or Trichoclusia knee, which is a uh, insect pest which can feed on a number of crops, including cabbage, beans, lettuce, spinach, tomato, cotton, and soybean. And we utilize this insect because it can be a pest on a number of important crops. And you can see in the uh, upper right-hand corner, this is a larva that's feeding in a um, insect feed cup, which a general purpose lepidopteran diet. 
you know, basically feed here, pupate, and then eventually emerge in this adult. And finally, the final, uh, final uh, cast member, if you will, for this manuscript is the AFMNPD baclovirus. So this is an entomal pathogenic virus, which means it is a virus which is a pathogen of insects, and it has a narrow range on a number of insect class compared to certain chemical insecticides. However, um, in terms of viruses, it actually affects a rather large range of insect pests, and so it can be utilized as a very effective biocontrol agent to control certain uh, insect pests in agricultural systems. And so when the insect is feeding on a leaf and then ingests these occlusion bodies that you see here, which are large protein coats which contain and protect the virions, then that will, protein coat will be broken down in the alkaline mid-gut of the insect release the virus particles, infect the insect and the mid-gut epithelial cells. The virus will reproduce, form more occlusion bodies, have secondary infections, and will ultimately lead to the death of the insect. And somewhat gruesome, the end, when the insect dies, it'll burst and then kind of spread those occlusion bodies over the leaf tissue where it was present, continuing the cycle if another larvae goes and eats that leaf tissue and ingests those occlusion bodies. Now, these are um, widely commercially available from certain suppliers. However, they do have some downsides and some weaknesses, I should say. Uh, they can be inactivated by UV radiation, and they also can be washed off during rain events. And so we were working with a, a number of scientists, particularly the polymer chemists I referenced before, to try to develop spray treatments and adjuvants that would help to increase the longevity of the virus and leaf surfaces. Um, and so what we originally did is we wanted to determine the LC50 rate of the virus applied to uh, four different crops. And so the LC50 rate is the lethal dose of the occlusion bodies of the baclovirus on the leaf tissue, where 50% of the insects die and 50% are able to survive the treatment. And so we applied the baclovirus in a commercial uh, research tax sprayer, which simulates the field rates and conditions, and we tested cotton, cabbage, green bean, and soybean. And we took and we allowed the treatments to dry, and we cut leaf discs out, leaf discs out placed um, neonates on top of the leaf disc, and allowed them to feed for 24 hours. After that 24-hour period of time, then we transferred them into the sealed cups you see on the right that contain general purpose lepidoptera diet and allowed the larvae to basically continue to grow for six days. So they had 24 hour period of time to basically ingest those viral um, inclusion bodies and that would determine whether or not they received a lethal dose. And we repeated these experiments a minimum of three times. And for our control studies, that was just the back of the virus alone of any other additive, we saw um, a very interesting response. And so on the y-axis is larval mortality, and on the x-axis is the dosage response or the virus application rate um, in a log scale. And what we found was that the cabbage, the green bean, and soybean, and cotton, they all had very similar um, viral potency on the leaf. So all the LC50 rates were statistically equivalent. However, on soybean, we had a very interesting result. We actually had a six-fold increase in susceptibility of the cabbage loopers when exposed to soybean. And we repeated this on over and over and over again, and we continually found the same result. And this was um, particularly interesting and curious to us because the green bean is very closely related to soybean. It's in the same family, the BACA. However, they had dramatically different, um, the, the insects had dramatically different susceptibility on soybean compared to all the other crops we tested. So we wanted to determine um, why exactly we have this enhanced activity. So um, these four crops were selected for the initial study because we wanted to test the um, baclovirus spray on a number of leaf anatomies. And so cabbage, cotton, green bean, and soybean 
are all different from one another. Cabbage, you have a glabrous leaf surface, which had no leaf hairs, was known as trichomes. And in soybean, you have a relatively dense trichome um, layer on leaf surface. And trichomes are known to be associated with plant defense against insect pests. Um, they can dissuade insects from eating the leaf tissue. They can actually cause um, physical damage to the larvae with the trichomes themselves impaling into the larvae. And so uh, the trichomes themselves might also, we theorize, might have helped to retain more of the virus from the initial field sprays. And so what I did is to test this, to determine whether or not it was the, the trichomes in the physical leaf surface, I actually very carefully took and hand shaved um, a ton of soybean leaves and eliminated the trichomes. So we had a soybean leaf with the trichomes intact and, um, intact and one that had them completely removed. We put them back into the sprayer and we looked at the larval mortality. We found that the trichomes, the physical leaf surface, had no significant impact whatsoever in the viral potency. So that left us with determining whether or not there were differences in leaf chemistry. And so to look at the differences of leaf chemistry of four distinct crops, they're going to be extremely numerous. And we had to narrow down our field of uh, inquiry of exactly what kind of leaf chemistries we were wanting to look at. And so we decided to um, focus on phenolic, the phenolic composition of the leaves, um, their known defense compounds. And we were able to identify them by HPLC and we verified them by LCESI and that's. And we identified three flavonoid compounds present exclusively in the soybean leaves. So we were not able, obviously they're in other plant species, but among the four species we looked at, we were only able to detect these three flavonoids in soybean. And they were datesin, genistein, and camphor. And this again is uh, somewhat interesting because these were not present in green bean, despite the fact that it's very closely related to soybean. And so we were able to determine the leaf level concentrations of these flavonoids and then incorporate them using um, DMSO into a artificial diet and then basically expose the insects to this diet to determine whether or not a, the flavonoid compounds themselves cause an increase in mortality and whether or not those compounds improve virus efficacy. And so what we found is when we exposed uh, or we allowed the insects to feed on these virus-free flavonoid diets, so there was no virus, there was no increase in mortality. The insects were very happy to eat, consume, grow, pupate, emerge, no problems whatsoever. Alone, so the individual flavonoids themselves, did not show any enhancement in baculovirus activity. There was no improvement with just the leaf level concentrations of the genesis and dates and camphor. However, when we combine them all together to be equivalent to what was found at the leaf, we found a significant improvement in the in enhancement of the insecticidal activity of the baculovirus against the cabbage looper, which was rather significant because by themselves we didn't, we didn't see an effect, but once we combine them all together, it was significant. And so we wanted to go and elevate the concentration of these flavonoids to be much higher than they were found in the leaf level, between 3.5 and 6 times the leaf level concentration. And we wanted to find out whether or not there was an increase in mortality. And we did not, again, similar to our previous result, the higher concentration of flavonoids had no impact on the mortality of the larvae. They even consumed the, the virus-free diets fine and with no problems whatsoever. However, at the higher concentrations, the dates and genistein and camphorol synergistically improve virus potency on their own, with the date scene having a 1.5 fold increase in um, virus potency compared to control, the genistein having a 2.3 fold increase, and the camphorol a 4.3 fold increase. So and we increased their concentrations, we got a strong response and an improvement in virus activity. And we wanted to determine whether or not this was um, a synergistic potentiation. So we used um, a cotoxicity factor to determine uh, whether or not these compounds were synergistically improving the baculovirus activity. 
Um, and this was determined by um, and outlined by these three papers. So if you go into the PDF and want to look into more details about how this was um, determined, then uh, I would suggest looking up these and the original paper that this was published in. And we found that Dateson, Camphrol, and Genistein were all synergistic, uh, synergistically improved the back of virus activity. So when there's a positive factor of greater than or equal to 20, then of the phototoxicity cofactor, then there was synergistic potentiation, and any value of less than 20 or greater than zero was additive potentiation. We found that um, Dateson just made the cutoff at 20, Genistein at 60, and Camphrol had the greatest cofactor factor of 150. So the question is, why might these flavonoid compounds, which are present and don't have any apparent impact on the mortality of the um, insect, what might be going on? Why might they be improving the virus efficacy? And so we're going to go back and kind of talk about how the insect protects itself from some of these bacteviruses. So the in the initial infection route, when the um, the bacteviruses is consumed, it enters into the midgut. The virions are released. They infect into the epithelial cells, and if they are able to um, reproduce, it will lead to secondary infections and ultimately the death of the insect. And so the um, insect immune system is relatively simple. Um, it relies on rapid apoptosis, premature cell life, lysis, and sloughing and excretion of the infected cells. And so an early onset of apoptosis of the infected insect cells can dramatically reduce virus concentrations about 50-fold. And so oxidative stress is an important part of this, and it can reduce both the bacrovirus activity and it can promote the sloughing of those epithelial milgut cells to eliminate them before they produce enough occlusion bodies. And so that rapid sloughing, that oxidative stress, that early apoptosis can all um, help to prevent the establishment of a systematic infection and can reduce the susceptibility of the insect to the virus. So increase sloughing and you can kind of stop that um, secondary infection from occurring and can save the insect from death. However, these three flavonoid compounds are known to be very potent antioxidants. They can help to reduce that ox oxidative stress, which can help to, uh, you know, with the oxidative stress will help promote apoptosis. They're also potent phytoestrogenic compounds with strong affinity to estrogen receptors. And estrogen is known to be anti-apoptotic, anti-inflammatory, and it will also inhibit the reactive oxygen species production. And so all of these combined, these flavonoid compounds may be reducing or delaying apoptosis, allowing for the rapid generation of the virus particles, decreasing sloughing, and then increasing the rate at which the secondary infections are occurring and increasing viral um, viral activity and ultimately insect death. So the main takeaways from this is that the individual flavonoid compounds found in soybean did not cause teen mortality on their own, but they were found to synergistically improve bacrovirus activity against the cabbage looper. And this synergy suggests that there is a potential breeding objective to find um, germplasms, which can improve plant resistance concurrent with an integrated pest management system with uh, bacrovirus application. And also the three flavonoid compounds we identified didn't completely account for the enhanced virus activity that we saw in soybean. And when our, which are, with our initial work, we found a six-fold increase in virus activity on soybean where the best we could get above leaf level concentrations with camphorol was only a 4.3-fold increase. So there's definitely additional biochemistries and additional aspects to that bacrovirus synergy that we can potentially discover and understand and incorporate into some uh, biocontrol treatments. So for our ongoing work, uh, we plan to utilize the USDA soybean germplasm collection at the University of Illinois, as well as the soybean collection at the NCAR facility, which leaves us uh, roughly 20,000 cultivars of soybean to kind of select from. And we are hoping to identify differences in these selected soybean genotypes, evaluating the LC50s, and using that to help determine differences in plant biochemistries 
and using those plant biochemistries and potential pathways which improve bacteviruses activity to develop adjuvants or spring treatments which can help to enhance and improve the biocontrol potency with the ultimate goal of improving food security. So we just talked about how um, plant secondary compounds can alter and change the efficacy of a pathogen in insects. And now we're going to kind of switch gears and we're going to talk about how changes to plant primary metabolism will impact and affect fungal secondary metabolism, in particular the production of mycotoxins. And so um, this paper was just recently published in the Journal of Agricultural and Food Chemistry and it outlines the effects of elevated CO2 on plant primary metabolism through grain nutritional content and how grain composition will then impact pathogen growth and toxin production and how this effect is cultivar and fungal species specific and has some uh, potentially concerning long-term implications for food security. So um, I'm going to go through a little bit of background because this is a rather complex system. So um, I ask for your patience and uh, please be bear with me. I'll try to get through the background information as quickly as I can. So concerning rising CO2, by the end of this century, we're expecting to see a doubling in CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. And that's going to have some very significant impacts on agriculture in general. And so um, in this system, we are specifically talking about wheat, and wheat is a C3 crop. And C3 photosynthetic plants are expected to have an increase in that photosynthetic rate, improved water status, less overall photorespiration, um, particularly compared to uh, C4 plants such as corn. Um, C4 plants evolved when atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations were much lower, and so they developed uh, carbon concentrating mechanisms to help them overcome that deficit. And that increase in photosynthate um, production and photosynthesis is going to be beneficial and increase the yield of the C3 plants. However, there is a downside. And that downside has been observed as nutrient dilutions in C3 plants. And so while you have increased carbon assimilation, and there's actually an increase in the abundance of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen compounds, but the plants are still limited by mineral nutrient availability. And so while the overall amount of protein stays the same, you're getting more and more carbohydrates being um, uh, filling into the grain and you're basically reducing the amount of protein just by the overall abundance of carbohydrates. And this has been observed previously where wheat, which is a C3 crop, produces far more carbohydrates under elevated CO2, which decreases overall grain protein, which is a very significant aspect of um, the grain quality because wheat protein is an essential aspect to you know, form breads, pastas, etc. And so one of the two chief concerns we have in trying to improve agriculture is finding most disease resistant and climate resilient crops. And so what is climate resilience? Well, it's the capacity to withstand and adapt to climate variability. And in terms of agriculture, it's the ability of an agricultural cropping system to withstand and adapt to climate induced abiotic and biotic stresses. And so in this work, we're primarily concerned with the effects of elevated CO2 on wheat nutrition, but then we're also concerned about the biotic stress from diseases. And the disease which we are primarily concerned with is Drosarium head blight, which is a fungal disease of cereals. It is uh, primarily caused by Fusarium gumidiarum in North America, and it infects into the wheat after flowering or on thesis, and it can contaminate the wheat grain with mycotoxins. And the primary mycotoxin we're concerned with is the fungal secondary metabolite, the oxygen of all in all. Um, it is a, a very thermal stable and uh, virulence factor, which causes plant cell death and enables the fungus to spread throughout the wheat head. And as that down accumulates, it reduces the grain yield, quality, and suitability as food or feed. And it can cause a feed refusal, um, can cause immunosuppression, can cause organ damage, and for example, in uh, pigs, it can cause loss of litters, and overall, it can reduce the overall amount of uh, profit a farmer can have if his wheat field is particularly contaminated, and it can cause 
problems down the line if it's fed to a number of animals. The bad news, that's kind of bad news, but additional bad news is that there's actually no true resistance to Fusarium hemboi. Um, the best resistance that we have is would be considered moderately resistant. So they own, there's only specific resistance traits which help to, with, to limit the spread of the fungal pathogen in the wheat. And this is primarily derived from a single cultivar called Sumai-3. And it is, we have previously um, looked at in our laboratory by a coworker of mine, Dr. Martha Vaughn, have looked at the effects of elevated CO2 on the severity of Fusarium head blight, elevated CO2, and she did some excellent work looking at um, a moderately resistant and susceptible cultivar with two different fungal strains and found that there was an increase in the Don production per unit biomass, changes in fungal biomass, and uh, the had a significant impact of primary metabolism on uh, both of those systems. However, because all this work was done together in elevated CO2, it was very difficult to untangle the direct impact of elevated CO2 on the host, on the pathogen, and then on the host pathogen interaction. So when we were looking at um, changes in the primary metabolites, it was difficult to determine which, you know, uh, which aspect of the system was responsible. And so um, together with uh, Dr. Mark Vaughan and a number of other scientists at the USDA, then we looked at the impact of elevated CO2 on the grain composition. So we wanted to find out how changes in nutrient composition might be impacting the fungus specifically. And we wanted to kind of untangle some of those difficult interactions. And so we used growth chambers configured to, um, for CO2 enrichment. And we had a set at 400 parts per million or approximately ambient CO2 and at elevated or 800 parts per million. Mm -hmm. And we selected the same two wheat cultivars, Elsin, which is a moderately resistant wheat to Fusarium head blight, and Norm, which is a susceptible variety. We grew them um, to maturity and then collected their seed for testing. And so uh, we looked at various grain characteristics. We looked at their protein concentration, their carbohydrate concentration, their mineral concentration, as well as the fatty acid. And then when we um, grew the fungal pathogens on the grain, we looked at the fungal growth, toxin production, and the expression of toxin biosynthetic pathways. And what we found is similar to what was observed in the research, um, the growth at elevated CO2 did significantly alter grain nutritional content. So both the moderately resistant and the susceptible cultivar had dramatic decreases in protein content. However, the Elson cultivar had a very dramatic drop in protein content down to 11.4%, which is very near that threshold where the the grain can no longer be used for um, baking of bread. And so it's, it's kind of a very concerning drop in protein overall. There was a corresponding increase in the amount of carbohydrate, um, but there was not an increase in the amount of food fiber. Um, as well, there was a decrease in the overall amount of ash that's present, which um, can be considered a corollary with mineral nutrition, but we'll talk about that in um, a slide shortly. And the main takeaway is that while both cultivars were impacted, the moderately resistant cultivar had a very severe drop in protein concentration. And we wanted to determine um, whether or not this decrease in protein, was this due to dilution that had been outlined previously, or was there some significant change in uh, the plant metabolism during seed fill? And so what we wanted to look at is the overall ratio of amino acids and looking at their percentages. And if there was a significant change in the metabolism of the plant, we would expect to see a dramatic change in a large number of these amino acid ratios. And if they stayed relatively the same, then there was just this dramatic addition of carbohydrates with diluted down the protein. And what we found is a majority of the amino acids were unaffected by elevated CO2, which indicates that the primary impact and loss of uh, protein was due to additional carbohydrates during grain fill. However, both varieties had 
changes in the same five amino acids with significant um, changes in threonine, alanine, proline, valine, and leucine. And that was for both the moderate resistant and the susceptible norm variety, which suggests there is um, some significant metabolic changes occurring in the plant. And so it's not completely due to this dilution due to um, increased photosynthetic rate. Additionally, the moderate resistant Elsin also had a more amino acid um, ratio changes compared to the susceptible variety with changes in serine and arginine. When looking at the mineral content, again, we see uh, both varieties had significant decreases in mineral content. However, the mildly resistant Elsin had far more and a greater magnitude losses in mineral content with 11% loss in phosphorus, 22% loss in calcium, 30% loss in zinc, 21% loss in iron, and a 25% loss in copper. Now, from, um, you know, from our perspective, this is rather concerning because all these are classified as essential mineral nutrients, and that's very concerning for, uh, concerning for the consumer. But this is also going to impact the fungal pathogen because they're a consumer of this grain too, even though we don't want them to be. And so um, this, and we're going to see, is going to have a rather significant impact in fungal growth. So we saw that dramatic increase in carbohydrates. And so we looked at the overall water-soluble carbohydrate concentration, and we saw that the norm variety had no significant changes in the carbohydrate concentration, but that moderately resistant Elsin had significant increases in glucose and maltose. However, there was no significant change in the total concentration of water-soluble carbohydrates, which suggests that the additional carbohydrates were storage carbohydrates such as starch. And also important to note that there was no significant change in sucrose and raffinose, which are known inducers of trichothecine biosynthesis, which is the mycotoxin, the oxygen volatile. And so uh, for fatty acids, Elsin, the Elsin cultivar had significant decreases in oleic and linoleic acid, while again, the norm cultivar had no significant changes. And this is um, a very interesting change because both of these fatty acids are known to be involved in plant resistant and fungal pathogens. So thank you for bearing with me and going through all the various changes and alterations to the grain composition. And so we wanted to basically identify and isolate the effect of elevated CO2 on just the grain and really detail how each one of those changes occurred. And now that um, we, had, we had the grain, we wanted to um, grow Fusarium germinium on this grain and determine the growth of mycotoxin production. And this allowed us to eliminate um, some confounding factors, such as plant defense response, because we freeze thawed the grain for five cycles to kill the wheat embryo and prevent it from germinating. And then it also eliminated the confounding factor of the direct CO2 effect on the fungus, which um, would impact it in the growth chain itself. And we can just see, okay, how does this nutritional content and the changes and this decline in protein and mineral and, and lipid concentration, how does this impact on the fungus? And we found that the, there were significant changes and the overall fungal growth and the mycotoxin production, particularly in the Elsin green, which was very significantly impacted, and it was strain specific for the fungus. And so the GZ3639 strain was not, was completely insensitive to changes in nutrient content in both the Elsin and the Norm variety. However, the 9F1 strain actually had about half the amount of fungal growth on that the Elsin grain that was grown at 2x CO2, which would you would think, oh, that's a good thing, right? You have less overall fungal growth. That seems like a great thing. However, the Don production per unit biomass tripled. And so the fungus was experiencing nutrient stress. And while there was less of it, it was producing far, far more toxin on that grain that had been grown at elevated CO2. And so we wanted to verify this. And we looked at the trichothecine biosynthesis pathways, and we looked at TRI1, 4, 5, and 6. And these genes, the TRI1, TRI4, TRI5 genes, all encode essential enzymes 
for the biosynthesis of DOM. And the TRI6 um, encodes a transcription factor, which uh, controls the trichothecium biosynthesis of um, other biosynthesis genes. Interestingly, TRI6 is also a self-regulating transcription factor, and so it will decrease its expression under nutrient-rich conditions. And what we found was that the Fisarin Gruminier minus one strain, similar to what we saw in the overall um, down production per unit biomass, it had significant increases in all of the tri genes on the grain that had been grown at 2XCO2. And interestingly, despite the fact that the GC3639 strain didn't show significant increases in bond production, um, that tri 6 gene was impacted by that change in nutri nutrient content and it doubled in the GZ3639 strain, indicating that even though it appeared to be insensitive, um, the trichothecine biosynthesis pathways was being significantly impacted by that change in nutrient content. So um, we went and separated out the complexities of the system to look at just how nutrient content will impact the fungal growth and trichothecine um, production. And so then we wanted to go back into the growth chambers and then retest and see whether or not we can replicate this result. And is it similar to what we saw in the seed assays? And so we grew both ELSIN and NORM at 1X and 2X CO2. And we inoculated them with point inoculations at anthesis or flowering with both the GZ3639 and the 9F1 strain. And as that disease progressed, you can see the, the bleaching of the wheat head as the fungus is basically progressing through that wheat head. And what we saw, we saw that the plants had more toxin and less nutrients. There was increased mycotoxin concentrations at elevated CO2 in the 9F1 strain. And again, we saw no difference in the GZ3639 strain, which was consistent with the seed trials that we had previously run. And this is, this is significantly concerning because um, the mildly resistant wheat had a threefold increase in toxin accumulation from Fusarium gruminiarum with F1. The 9F1 strain produced relatively low amounts of toxin at ambient conditions, and that increased threefold as soon as it was grown at 2XCO2. So you're getting grain that has less protein, less mineral nutrients, and then all of a sudden it's promoting toxin production um, for this 9F1 strain. And this raises concerns as well. Is, is this increase in toxin and reduction in nutritional content, is this consistent among other moderately resistant cultivars, or is this just cultivar specific and strain specific to Elson and Nine One? And so um, some takeaways on the impact of these nutritional changes. So we saw that the moderately resistant cultivar Elson that had been grown at 2XCO2, 800 parts per million, had severe losses in protein, fatty acid, and mineral content, which resulted in a grain which you could describe as being a poor, uh, poor fungal growth medium for the pathogen. And this induced nutrient stress, and those, that nutrient stress increased the overall expression of that variance-related genes and induced the accumulation of trichothecines. And so that nitrogen limitation increased trichothecin biosynthesis and resulted in greater down production for unit biomass. And the 9F1 strain appears to be more sensitive to that nutrient limitation as significant dis differences were detected both in biomass and down production. And so what are some of the um, food security concerns? What is the potential impact for this? Well, if this is the case for my resistant cultivars, then there's a potential that um, there'll be a reduced efficacy of resistance factors in wheat currently considered my resistant to FHP if there's a decrease in overall nutrient content and that causes an increase in specific strains to produce mycotoxins. That also is gonna have um, an impact on strain-specific pathogens, and that might completely shift the overall pathogen population by um, providing an advantage to strains which are producing toxins because it is a virulence factor. Uh, wheat growers may be less likely to choose moderately resistant cultivars if there's a decrease in the overall nutrient content and they're not providing that same level of resistance, which might be a trap because then all of a sudden they're also planting cultivars, which are going to be more susceptible to FHB, even if they have higher nutrient content. Um, and so all of these questions kind of raise concerns over the uncertainty of future food security and um, 
we are pursuing uh, research to identify whether or not this is a consistent effect in the moderately resistant cultivars. And so collaborating with Dr. James Anderson from the University of Minnesota, who's a wheat plant breeder, they were testing uh, 15 wheat cultivars and similar assays, and they range in FHB susceptibility from uh, nine to two, with one being the most resistant, which is 100% resistant, and we're trying to identify um, cultivars which are both climate resilient as well as disease resilient and have uh, excellent grain quality as well as disease resistance. So our future goals and plans is to identify markers that can be used by breeders to simultaneously target climate resilient mycotoxin as well as high grain quality traits. And we want to go and test in these cultivars to determine um, their overall climate resilience and FHB resistance. We want to determine the impact of elevated CO2 on photosynthesis, water use efficiency, growth development, yield, and nutrition to provide as much details and information to plant breeders as possible so that they can um, make uh, excellent breeding choices in the future. And we also want to test grain quality of neuroisogenic lines and pair of lines used for FHB resistance at elevated CO2. And finally, we want to identify um, additional fusarium dominium strains which may become more aggressive in future climate conditions due to changes in nutrient composition. So uh, thank you very much for listening to my talk. I would like to acknowledge all the wonderful scientists, technicians, support staff, and collaborators that I have. Um, I want to thank the USDA for just being extremely supportive and just being a wonderful, uh, a wonderful place to work in. So with that, um, I would happily take any questions you have, and thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Will. Great presentation on a two very complex topics and, and certainly uh, show the, the degree of complexity of the interactions and its impact on product safety and, and quality. We have a, one question is, do you consider it would be possible to modify the phylosphere bacteria to make them secrete flavonoids as a strategy to combine with the entomopathogenic virus? Um, I suppose that would be a possibility. Um, the, so one of the hopes that we have is there's an entomologist that we're, entomologist that we're working with and we're very um, interested in trying to determine uh, exactly what aspects of the insect um, kind of metabolism and defense response is being impacted and whether or not we might be able to um, either replicate that effect with different compounds or identify key aspects of it. But the, I think the main uh, concern would be the overall level of flavonoids that would be um, necessary. And one of the aspects that it, it, may, it may be better to just identify plant genotypes, which are very high, they produce very high concentrations of those flavonoids that actually might be um, a, real, um, um, a better overall approach. However, I don't have uh, any, a large amount of experience with biocontrol agents. That's actually a, a completely separate group in the unit. So I am sure that they probably have some wonderful mad scientist ideas about how to, to uh, engage in that kind of research that I couldn't even uh, do right now. So I don't know if that answer helps, but I hope it did. All right, great, thank you. What was your criteria to select the CO2 enrichment levels? Oh. Then, um, then to follow on from that, what was the method that you used to enrich the growth chambers? Oh, okay. Um, so we selected the criteria of the doubling of the CO2 concentration based off of the expected CO2 concentration at the end of the century. Um, and so we wanted, because we're working in growth chambers, um, a lot of the phase studies that have been done elevate CO2 about 200 parts per million, which gives us a good idea about what the um, effect about 50, 35, 50 years down the road depending on how much CO2 is being produced. And we kind of wanted to take a longer term look. And it also um, helped us to get kind of a stronger signal of exactly how this is gonna impact 
the plant physiology and the overall nutritional content of the grain. And for the CO2 enrichment in the chambers, we actually um, utilized a, a package from the Conviron company where they were able to set up the chambers to actually enrich CO2 in the growth chambers. And we essentially had CO2 tanks and it was um, using a, a climate controlled system that basically regulated the amount of CO2 that was being injected into the tanks um, over the entire course of the plant growth. All right, great. Have you uh, and your team explored the possibility of introducing a means of neutralizing the toxins uh, the fusarium species produces, perhaps via the use of a symbiotic bacterial strain? Oh, so that's, that's a really good question. Um, so there is a large effort for, to look at um, biocontrol methods to actually prevent the Fusarium gaminiarum uh, pathogen from producing toxins. Unfortunately, the toxins themselves are um, extremely resilient. I mean, they're extremely uh, thermal resilient, even in processing of the grain materials. And um, I am not aware currently of um, biological chemistry which effectively neutralizes it. Uh, in plants such as barley, what they'll actually do is they'll attach a glucose to the toxin. And for the plants, it's great. It detoxifies the um, it detoxifies the dawn. It doesn't negatively impact the plant, and it can grow and be fine. However, for consumers, um, once that that grain is harvested, that toxin is just basically masked. And as soon as it you consume it, or it's consumed by another animal, that glucose pops off, and all of a sudden that toxin's active again. So in biological systems, they typically just slap on a glucose and assume it's fine. Um, directly neut uh, neutralizing is kind of the um, is kind of the ideal mechanism, but I'm not aware that that has been fully realized. There are some technologies which uh, have found to be somewhat effective, but I don't know if they have been tested large scale. Uh, we are working right now on a number of biocontrol agents to actually um, inhibit the initial infection of the the fungal parathesia when it actually launches the spores in the air. It's, I mean, the, this pathogen is, um, it's almost out, out of a sci-fi novel on these essentially little spring-loaded traps. And after a rainstorm, they'll trigger. And then when there's another rain event, they'll launch these spores into the air and turn them into the uh, flowers. And so a lot of um, work that we're doing right now is trying to identify uh, bacterial agents which can actually prevent those Parathesia from forming and stop that infection cycle because otherwise the fungus will very happily just grow on uh, straw and litter that's left over from the previous year. So I don't know if that helps. Is, um, is there another question? Oh, sorry, I was muted. <laughs> no, it's okay. Ah, oh, yeah, there was a question. So, um, does fertilization with nitrogen and or other micronutrients negate the effect of elevated CO2? That's a great question. So, the answer is um, yes, no, and maybe. So, there is conflicting research in the literature, um, the vast majority of, of research tends to show that uh, nitrogen fertilization um, before or at anthesis does not fully recover the protein present in the grain and has a lot to do with um, the sink metabolism in the wheat. Um, some research show that it can somewhat recover the amount of protein, um, but then there's also the potential issues with um, excessive nitrogen fertilization and runoff um, however, it should be noted that in wheat, there's this significant nutrient decline. However, that's not seen in legumes. And so, for example, soybean, which we talked about previously, when they have that, uh, the nodules that form with, that, with the um, symbiotic bacteria, which can fix nitrogen, and they don't have an issue whatsoever, according to massive uh, studies that were done um, looking at the meta-analysis uh, meta of all of the effects of elevated CO2, there's 
not a significant loss in protein in soybeans. And so there's clearly a, um, a nitrogen availability as well as the sink effect of actually transporting that nitrogen into the grain and storing it as protein. All right. Um, the next question is inside the greenhouse or the glass house, uh, CO2 concentration is relatively high. Does this mean that wheat grown in these would be nutritionally less valuable? And if so, would these low protein traits be inherited in breeding programs? In other words, this reduce the efficiency of breeding under a greenhouse. So. Um, I guess it would depend on, on the overall concentration, how significant the impact was. Uh, one of the things that from some of our current work that we've been doing, which we're hoping to publish soon, is that we found that um, there is a very, very cultural specific differences between these plants. And um, you can have you can have cultivars which have very similar protein concentrations when they're grown at ambient CO2, and you can see just this dramatic shift. Um, once they're grown at elevated CO2 in height and protein content. And so um, one of the things that we're working with Dr. James Anderson from the University of Minnesota is really to, to help elucidate what is going to occur in the future for a lot of these um, plants which are used, their progeny are used in you know, ongoing research programs, which may be carrying traits which are going to end up being very detrimental in the long term for a lot of these uh, crops. Um, and so it's kind of an ongoing effort to, to really help um, make aware for plant breeders uh, about the concept of uh, climate resilience and the impact of uh, nutrients as well as disease resilience at elevated CO2 because it does have a very significant impact on the overall um, development and nutritional content of the plant because if you think about it, you're essentially doubling the available carbon dioxide which the plant is using to produce all of its photosynthate. And so that's going to have really significant you know, downstream impacts on the plant metabolism. Great. Um, the last question is, are there transcriptional regulators similar to quorum sensing molecules and bacteria that work on fungal secondary metabolite synthesis? I want to say yes. However, I really wish that everyone was back at work <laughs> during this pandemic because literally I have a coworker who could answer that um, with, the, you know, with great clarity. Um, and so just to make sure I don't give an incorrect response, I'm going to um, politely request to and you know, apologize for not giving an um, adequate answer. But um, I hope I'll, I'll see if I can email um, a coworker and they might be able to provide you a better answer. Great. So I actually have one question, you know, based on your work, you're dealing with a lot of different multidisciplinary teams. Yes. And that by itself brings a lot of challenges. What tools or recommendations would you have for others as we move to these more complex uh, interactions within teams to be able to address our problems of the future? Um, I think one of the aspects, and, and um, how do I put it, um, for me personally, I found you know, uh, scientists can be quirky, and I think we're a, a very fun lot, but we can kind of have uh, difficulty communicating and talking with one another and kind of focusing on our goals. And for my work, especially at the USDA, um, we have, there's a, an atmosphere of collaboration here. Um, and that definitely is something that I really enjoy that wasn't present during my, um, my graduate study work and university. Um, because we all kind of share a, a common goal and um, there's not a kind of a lot of butting of heads and trying to really push forward for, you know, uh, butting people out of for career advancement pressures and things like that. But we're all very focused and we have leaders that, that continually reinforce that 
our goal is to help the American public, to help farmers and consumers. And um, that generates a, an atmosphere of collaboration and wanting to work together and just uh, focus on the end product, which is just, just basically helping to preserve food security, having safe food and helping farmers basically take care of themselves and take care of the world. And I know that sounds very, very cliche, um, but that does have a, a long a downstream impact. And on a more kind of um, personal level, I found that for myself, I've been involved um, with about 20 different projects in five years at the USDA. And I found that for me personally, um, if I approach the if I approach the situation expecting that I'm going to be doing 90% of all the work and I'm going to help others and just ask them for a favor and then know that you know in the future I'm going to help them with their work and just basically taking on the mantle of like I expect you know I expect to um, kind of take on the brunt of the the writing and the work and things like that then a lot of people are much more interested um, in helping with that work and working together uh, to basically have that final product. I don't know if that helps. It does indeed, and at least in my experiences over the years, vision and having a common vision has been a critical component to successful collaboration. So that does reinforce my own observations. So with that, we will conclude our webinar today, and we hope uh, that you will join us again in the future. Will, thank you very much for a great presentation and for addressing the questions. And we look forward to seeing everyone on our next webinar. So with that, thank you. Thank you. have a great day. Thank you. Thank you very much.